Hi, before we start the film, I will let you know I will be at Twin Cities Con this year, November 11th, 12th, and 13th. I'll be selling my comics and artworks, and I have a table. So come see me at Twin Cities Con. Um, we'll put the link down below so you can get your tickets early. There is a discount for that as well. Mm -hmm. It's at the Minneapolis Convention Center. We love to talk to fans. Um, we love to see support of the show. So come see me at Twin Cities Con, November 11th, 12th, and 13th. Oh. Now for the episode. Okay, Michael Powell is one of those achieving, wonderful, celebrated directors, but he doesn't get the level like Alfred Hitchcock or David Lean, and the reason is simply because of this movie. Yeah, this movie killed Michael Powell's career. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he's still like, how did I do that? Well, this movie. Yeah, yeah so today we're talking The Red Shoes. Wait, no? No, right. Oh, okay. Blackberry. Well, yeah. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about the film that effectively destroyed Michael Powell's career, but is one of Martin Scorsese's favorite movies. Welcome back to the show. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gothi from GoatFromReviews.com. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. Thanks for finding us. Thanks for watching. And for our loyal fans, thank you for continuing to support the show. You can follow the show on Twitter and on Instagram. We do have a Patreon. Check that out for some great deals. So tell us what upcoming movies we should critique. Both Kyle and I are members of the Minnesota Film Critics Alliance. Check out the webpage for critics reviews as well as ours. And today we're going to talk about Michael Paul's controversial film, Peeping Tom. All right. Mark Lewis is a filmmaker working for a British movie studio. He also works as a photographer for a local porno shop and wants to direct one day. But Mark is also hiding a very, very dangerous secret. He's a killer. Yeah. Armed with a camera and a very sharp tripod, Mark <laughs> okay. has a fascination with capturing death on film. When he meets an attractive young neighbor, he sees a potential way out. But does he really want one? So, uh, if you didn't really know, Michael Powell loves to work with color. If you haven't seen Red Shoes or you haven't seen Black Narcissus, it's still, he <laughs> loves color in that three-step colors. I don't know how he magically does it, but like the platform is blue, but the people are red and the background's green and all that stuff. But of course, when you've been working in black and white for a long time, and then you're eventually able to excessively work with color, you're going to enjoy it as well. Mm -hmm. He also likes to put a little fan on people for unnecessary times so their hair would fly bit. yeah <laughs> he always does that little trick and I enjoy that because this is my first time ever seeing this movie even though I did see Red Shoes and Black Narcissist a lot of times but I can see a lot of the signature things that Michael Powell does with movies also you say your lines but then you after you're done you're saying lines you turn away oh, yeah. or yeah or you turn away and then you say your lines and then you so it's always that constant movement in the films, even though the camera not really necessarily move. It's a signature thing of seeing when we see a Michael Paul movie that I kind of appreciate for this. Perhaps the camera doesn't move because like it takes a lot of work to set up the lighting in that kind of a uh, image. Yeah. So like the characters so. have to do something because we can't move the camera. Maybe that's it. I don't know. Uh, this is actually my first Michael Powell film. I own the Red Shoes. I've been right. meaning to watch it. I've seen some of the clips from it because it's another movie that Martin Scorsese always talks about. I think about. it's a far more horror movie than this is. Oh, really? Okay. Red Shoes is. Well, yes. Break out my you know, it's the artist who creates a person for artistic but thinks he the ownership of it. Mm. Yeah. So, but we're getting back to Peeping Tom. Yeah, so with Peeping Tom, it's I'm, I'm ashamed that the stream I had was a standard definition stream of this movie. I wish I could see something like this in the 4K because yeah. it just looks like that color scheme is just, it's just gorgeously yeah. on display. Uh, what I appreciate about the film so much is that this is a movie that predates Psycho, but it hits a lot of those voyeuristic predates Hitchcockian Halloween. ideas. Yeah. yeah. So as the argument, I, I see this happening a lot during Halloween as people go on their YouTube channels and they go, Halloween isn't the first slasher, it's Black Christmas, and people should stop saying nice things about Halloween being the first slasher. And my response usually is, oh, it's Psycho. And then I usually go, oh, and also Peeping Tom. Uh, because it is one of those movies where it, it set up a lot of the things that we would eventually see being overused in modern day slashers. Right. You know. So it set up, you know, set up the pitch for other people to hit the ball out of the park. With yeah. What you see, um, Martin Scorsese critiquing it says it's very much like eight and a half. It is a film talking about the advances of film inside making a film. Yeah. So you have like you know setting MGM used to do this for musicals where the characters in the movie set up the lights for it. Oh, yeah. Their dance things as well. There's a nut. There's a cute little dance number in this movie. Yeah. So it's very interesting that it's almost like like Fulcini would do of a movie making a movie that seems surreal, but it's also 
the contamination of filming because he's obsessed with filming. Yeah. Even though he's not part of the crew. He's kind of part he's of the capturing crew. capturing stuff that's not necessary. Right. <laughs> he's constantly like, oh, this is a good thing, this film. I mean, even the opportunity of somebody at the bed that's far more interesting to talk to, but what's going on in the window, I need to capture this. Mm -hmm. So it's that obsession that I think filmmakers can relate to. Like, you get obsessed with, oh, that's a great shot. We have to figure out something with the movie or like that. But also the massacring, like he wants to not only capture it on film, but also capture the reactions that kill him also. Yeah, there's yeah. that idea of if I can capture the last moment of life and that transition to death in my camera, I might be able to find like that purpose to existence. You know, there, there's that like he's trying to reconcile the issues of his past by capturing the pain and horror that other people feel because it might make him feel better. And fun fact, uh, the the older audio of the father and son of uh, what is it, Mark and his father, yeah. is actually uh, Michael Powell and Michael Powell's son, <laughs> voicing those characters. Which a lot of people thought was very uh, telling about him, but it turns out it's not the fact. Um, yeah, I I like that. There's that viewpoint of that. There's also the sense that by using a camera, it's not voyeurism; it's filmmaking. You know, it's kind of like trying to subvert the peeping tom aspect of I'm not a peeping tom, yeah. I'm a filmmaker. You know, right. whereas that's what film is. It's all of us peeping on someone else's life. You know, Scorsese said it really well where he said, a person who appears on film is giving you something that can't be given again. Uh, there's still cultures that don't allow you to take pictures of them. And this is capturing something that you can never recapture the same way. Right. You never can recapture 1960. I never mm -hmm. lived in 1960, but you get the you know, what could be what I can <laughs> sense what 1960 is through this movie. Yeah. Not to mention what you're trying to break for barriers of 1960. You're trying to move out and transition to shock people. And then we had talked about it with Robert Hughes' book, Shock the New. You can't make advances with creativity without shocking. Mm -hmm. That's an element that you have to put in your movie. Not to mention, you have to create something new all the time. And artists and writers have to think of, you can't just recycle things. You have to think of what can I do and how to shock because you can't move forward without shock. Yeah. And this it's, movie is You have to see what shocking. the senses are to know how you can move past it. And I find it very funny. Yeah, this is April 7th, 1960. Psycho wouldn't come out until June 16th of that year. And yet, in Psycho, everyone who saw that film was uproared. There's a woman in her underwear in a yeah. flushing toilet. Yeah. And this has nudity. <laughs> and a lot of color, yeah, right. A lot of it. And that got banned, but Psycho did it. Yeah. yeah. And it's just shocking to me that a film that came before, and, and I, I'm still more of a fan of Psycho, but a film that came before, like Peeping Tom, can have all this stuff on display, and it's it's just like in America, we didn't we, we were like upset about toilets. You know? Right. So. And I think we're going to relate to background a little bit. Um, Michael Paul was a very celebrated film director mm -hmm. in the 40s, and especially the late 40s. He got a lot of Academy Awards. In this, I think people, usually fans and audience, are not like, what are you doing with your career? It's almost like you're, stay, you're retaining, you're going back. Mm -hmm. But it's not. that's not true. He's trying to advance criteria, yep. trying to advance artistic writings and advance what could be a horror movie, what could be shocking, is a little snippet of a movie mm -hmm. where the whole aspect of it I think is a well-made production. Yeah. It's it's yeah. a very classical type of movie. You know, yes. it, it yeah. feels like it's got the same kind of beats to it as even just going back for me as a universal horror fan. It has that kind yeah. of pace of a let's just exist in this world for a while, let's peel back the layers. Um, let's not let's not run the gun and try to be the fast pace, but let's just look at this man as a character. Look at this flawed human being. We're not we're not, you know, on his side, but yeah. we want to understand him because he's confusing us as viewers. There's that kind of question to it. Um, it's funny that we we say a lot of things like horror is still kind of viewed as the redheaded stepchild of the, you know, the business. Yes. Yeah. But I will say this: when someone like a Jordan Peele, who is known for comedy and non-horror stuff, decided to make a horror film, not as many people were saying you're going to destroy your career. Yeah. So that's at least one step in the right direction because at the moment that Powell decided he was going to make this film that is essentially a horror movie, uh, everyone yeah kind of viewed him as like, well, you're done. You better move to Australia and start making movies there. Well, it's the it's the component of component of you never made a horror movie and now you are. Yeah. Where Michael Curtiz always kind of mm -hmm. dipped his hands in horror movies, and then he went on to do like Casablanca and all that stuff, and his career he was able to continue make film. Yeah. So it's always that staple. Oh my God, you made these accomplished, oh, sometimes nominated for Best Picture, but now you're making a horror movie? It's like you're throwing away your life. Yeah. 
Where I mean, I think even Alfred Hitchcock recognized it. He always said Psycho is not a horror movie. Well, oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, it's, it's like you know, and it's that thriller, way I, yeah. I defend the fact that Hitchcock's probably just you know defending his career at that point. To be I think like, so oh, too. They're like, thrillers. They're all thrillers, guys. Yeah. Um, but even you know, even Boris Karloff, I think, said that he didn't like the term horror for Frankenstein. So. What can you do? <laughs> right. It's almost like, what is your opinion of what it could be a horror movie? Yeah, I think it's the idea of skirting skirting the line because horror, you know, much like when we talked about Pearl and X, horror and adult films were intrinsically the yeah. bad thing to do. They're the thing that's wrong exactly. through your career. They're disgusting. They're gross. We have the Hayes Code. We have the EC Comics getting destroyed. We have all these elements that are happening during that time period of, like, we have to get rid of horror. And so you're just defending your career at that point to be like, oh, this is just a thriller. It's a case study. <laughs> you know? But there's an aspect of this movie that's talking about the audience where mm -hmm. uh, Tom, you know, the character, Carl Baum's character, is yeah. presenting to the woman all this whole movies. And, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me, she's like, oh, that's shocking. Do you want me to stop? No, keep going. Yeah. Which is like all of us, right? And there's there's also the <clears throat> the combination scene of she's watching. She's the voyeur watching yep. the video at that point. And when he wants to videotape her watching it, she's like, no, oh, no get that, that off of that, me. That, I don't want to be the, the subject, but I'd rather, you know, it's, we all want to be the person staring. We don't want to be the person stared at. Right. <laughs> we want to be in the shadows seeing everything. We don't want to be, you know, it's yeah. almost like you don't want to, you don't want to be filmed in the movie theater watching the film. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, you know, like I said, sometimes that's the best thing about watching a horror movie is one you've seen before is watching yeah. the person you're with watching it. <laughs> but there's a great scene of when the camera films to film projector mm -hmm. and it rotates. My God, Scorsese took that to the beginning of Mean Streets mm. where the home videos are playing, the beginning of the movie, the home videos, and then he takes the camera and turns around. You can see a lot of, like, John Carpenter, you know, point yeah. of view of the camera. I mean, even with E.T., yeah, Eve T was in that ghost outfit and it looked, you know, the holes and everything. Oh like yeah. That. So there's a lot of other filmmakers, especially from the New Hollywood era, lifted those things from this movie to their own films. Yeah. You can see a lot of influences from them. Yes. So horror, you know, and, and this film really gets down to it. Horror is less of a specific genre and more of a scale. Most of the movies we I call agree. horror today yeah. are at a hundred on that scale. But every film has somewhere above zero in horror because there's got to be something that is in, in, innately within us that wants to see what happens next. And usually yes. it's that enticement of Ooh, what's happening. So even every romance film probably has a one on the horror scale because it's not zero. There's a little bit of that like trepidation. You know, there's a little bit of that to it. This film just happens to be the progenitor of a lot of those other films. You know, having the, the high female body count, having the voyeurism, having, uh, I mean, before Jalo was even really a thing, this had a very Jalo esque weapon. I've turned a tripod yeah. into a stabbing Keep weapon. Keep going, right. Um, and it's almost a substitute for his other male. Oh, there's yeah. a lot of appendage work in this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Right. That you could get away but with But again, that. going back to that relationship we can between see now. the adult stuff and the horror stuff. You know, he's a photographer yeah. of nude women, and he's also penetrating other women. Like, there's yeah. that relationship has always been there. It's just one of them is still one of them is viewed as a little bit less nasty and the other one is still kind of viewed by the general public as wrong and it's it's it, that constant evolution if you will all right so that's a little bit of background and mm -hmm. a little bit of review so up next is our full review so i don't know i, I was thinking well, as i was watching this i was like should i present this if i was running a film class as required viewing for film rather than psycho and it's hard to balance i don't know if it's I think if you want to be a film director and you want to see what the other influence comes, I think it's required viewing for this mm. film. One thing I like to think about with that is if I were running a film class, give me some money, people. Um, if I were running a Go film class, me. it would always be pairs of films. It would be films that are in relationship to each other. So I was actually thinking of that a, a while ago with the, the question of what would I pair like a film like this with? And in my mind, I immediately went to other Pre or Powell films. But it's yeah. probably better to pair it with a psycho because the films are very different. They have kind of the same, like, same meat and potatoes, but it's how they're cooked is differently. Yeah. Uh, same recipe. Yeah. yeah. They're very different movies on the surface, though, and I think showcasing them, and you can showcase them the difference of how Americans viewed this kind of subject material versus how UK did, even yeah. though Hitchcock was... I'm, not, I'm waiting know. for your thesis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give me money and I'll do Writers it. Like, to, like, like to write about it. We go back and write, mm -hmm. then you're going to write to compare to Psycho to this movie. So, all right, Peep and Tom has a lot of influences from what we see from New Hollywood, like 
what I already mentioned, like uh, Carpenter and Scorsese and everything. And it has the right feeling all the time that there's an unease to this guy, even though he does the most mundane things of clean up shop. He's like, like who is my next victim? Yeah. And not to mention, he is, with presentation, he's, he's messed up. There's a disorder there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it, it feels like kind of how... You like know, Norman Bates. Yeah, we're like, we can understand what's wrong with him. We don't have to condone what he does. And that's, that's again, a centralized yeah. question a lot of people have trouble with with horror. You know, and even even recently there was the question of... His dad terrorized you know, him, for God's yeah. sakes, yeah. There was the question with the recent, you know, the recent Joker adaptation that it's like, why are we focusing on this monster? And it's like, here's the point about that film is we're not saying what he's doing is okay. We can yeah. still understand that he was a victim in some ways and that he's, you know, not being helped by the system... And still not condone the horrible things he does. Right, That's my, how we see uh, Mark Lewis's character. And my, for my judgment, I think they had the right, the wrong disorder for the Joker, mm. as well as they need to do something else with other than just a mama's boy. Yeah, right. But this guy is damaged. Yeah, but he masks it so well that everybody's comfortable engaging with him. He's not like the Joker, where you can see the outside features. Mm -hmm. The exaggeration is how tightly wound up he is. Yeah. And the way to express himself is through camera. He holds a camera almost like it's a toy. It's almost like his... You take it away from Don't him, he's going to have a fit. Him, yeah. It's almost like the blue blankie for Gene Wilder. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. So I love that, na that the, the, the nature of that. This is almost a, my identity. So my, like my photograph, my card. Right? Yeah. And there's that, yeah, there's that scene when Anna Massey, who was also in Hitchcock's Frenzy, a film we talked about a while ago, yeah. uh, Anna Massey tries to get him to leave it behind for their date. Like, just, you know, you don't need it right now. You don't need it right now. And he's like, no. Because <laughs> <laughs> I might um, miss an opportunity. Yeah. yeah. And that, so he does that's leave that's it. And there's that idea that he doesn't enjoy the night the same way. You know, he, he has yeah. like, he realizes he may not need it as much, but he'd still rather have it. We all cling to our vices, if you will. You know, I tend to find when I'm having a particularly rough set of days, not just a day, but like a streak of bad days, a bad week, a bad month, I tend to go back to playing like, a bunch of video games like I did when I was a kid or I'll tend to watch those like kids cartoons that made me feel better we all have our like safety blankets um, and yeah. I think this is his it's just maybe not a, a safe safety blanket <laughs> but it's, I think it's still prevalent now because there's a lot of people who let's go on a date and leave your phone get yeah. off your phone or you know that conversation or just get away from talking about sports or something just divorce yourself for some, something that you're obsessed with right yeah I go on dates all the time with my wife. I've never talked movies, right? You mm. could, it's hard to like, oh, that movie, right? right. Yeah, my yeah. wife and I have this constant struggle about I want to talk about movies and books and she wants to talk about pharmacy stuff and and we just try our best to like kind of maneuver around <laughs> it. Like there's always that idea of like, well, we're interested in what each other does, but yeah. we also like, we do want, you got to put it away every once in a while. Well, I get criticized by a lot of people for not answering texts very quick, but usually it's because I'm just trying to get the phone out of the room because I will grab it if it's in front of me. Yeah. Um, I want to be in the moment more. But this, this always is the question that I like with this character, especially with, um, the, especially for this movie is what's the difference between a compulsion and an obsession, mm -hmm. right? And this is, I think you can't really say obsession. This is actually a compulsion. It is his entire center being yeah. is filming. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really care about anything else. I think the obsession is more with seeing that moment of death, whereas the filmmaking part of it is the compulsion. I do think there's like a little right. bit of both, where like the obsessive part of him is, is on this idea of capturing something that has never been captured before. And the compulsion is capturing everything, just right. using this and everything thing. It's uh, one of those. If you want, you heard talk to a psychologist. I just asked her a question: What's the difference between a compulsion and obsession? And you're going to get a story, just like with a math <laughs> teacher: Is math invented or is just discovered? And you're going to get a. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> Mark Lewis though is the kind of guy I can see if I was at a concert would be the guy with his phone out the whole time that everyone just gets pissed <laughs> off at. Yeah, just, so fun fact: Put your phone away at the concert. They could remake Mark. this movie, and the guy would just sit there like this the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly the same thing. He yeah. reminds me actually of, uh, and, and they make this joke, Scream 4 has a character who's always filming stuff for his live streams and stuff like that. And they reference Peeping Tom and how it was one of the first films to have the voyeuristic like scene from the killer's point of view. I see I a did, lot of that. I've seen a lot of from American Beauty. Yeah. Let's photograph Beauty. a bag floating in the air. Right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, there's that, that compulsion to capture everything on film. Uh, even recently, one of the one of the lesser living dead films, Diary of the Dead from George A. Romero, ha has a whole filmmaking aspect to it where it's it like if we don't capture it, it's like it didn't happen. Yes, you know, and we live in that. There's a new generation coming that if it did not exist on YouTube, then it's 
you didn't, it didn't happen at all. Hey, fun fact, we exist then. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's a, it's a unique movie. I'm still like... I Still prevalent. I don't feel like I have to choose between my children, but if you made me choose this or Psycho, I would pick Psycho. It's just a bit more of a kind of... Right. To my sensibilities. I think but, it's just, if you go see Red Shoes and Black Narcissist and a couple of other films, and you see this, it's like, where you, your trajectory is different. And I think that's the whole point of it is... You look at his career, and then it's like a different trajectory. Yeah, I'm surprised more people didn't blame Pressburger, who yeah. was his co-writer for a number of years. He wasn't working with him when he made Peeping Tom. So, like, if you were upset about him turning to this, yeah. go get his handler, okay? Because <laughs> that's the guy who he kind of changed his ideas once that happened. I'm trying to but... think. It'd be almost like Sam Mendes is doing a slasher film. Yeah, yeah I'm trying like to that. think of any filmmaker who like just veered completely into horror. The, clo yeah. the closest one I'm, I'm thinking, thinking of, like, prestige wise, would be Scorsese with maybe Cape Fear. But he always did. You he know? always got his hands messy and dirty. Yeah, the thing was, he yeah. was always kind of a little bit. But I'm trying to think like Sam Mendes or something like that, or somebody accomplished all of a sudden just went, boo. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah, it's very confusing to me. But from their point of view, I don't see it. Yeah, maybe this is too old, too long. I think yeah, the the shock. You know, you said shock is important to that to that pressing part. Yeah. We've been shocked enough times in the past sixty two years that we're not we're not shocked by this film anymore. Right. Um, you can show this at seven p.m. at Turner Classics, and nobody's going to be. Oh yeah, yeah I think this. Gonna... I think this movie is is actually shown in uncut fashion, which does feature a good amount of female nudity. I think it's rated TV fourteen, um, and yet it's uh, <laughs> it's got a lot of those elements that we would have been shocked by. I think at the time. Right. But we're just not there yet. I mean, even the actress Pamela Greer, uh, Green said uh, she wasn't afraid to appear nude, nude in the film, but acting, that was terrifying. <laughs> so everyone has their different shocks, I guess. Um, <laughs> and this was hers. So yeah. I think the movie is important. I think it was right. excellently put together. It's a massive um, footnote because of how influenced it is. Yeah, and I'm, I'm hoping that with us talking about it today and with more people talking about it, that it gives you as an audience member, if you're a fan of horror, Go check it out. It's going to be different than most other horror movies that are made today because it is of a time period. I'm thinking like Michael Curtiz is like House of Wax. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. It's, it's a movie that stands kind of on its own in that Criterion selection. I hope that, that it gets a nicer 4K release because I'd love to see the film as an upgraded release. It's still kind of, it's still kind of seen as like that, you know, off in the distance film. And I hope right. it gets a larger viewing. If you haven't seen the film, please check it out. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. thanks for joining us, guys. Make sure if you haven't seen Peeping Tom to go check it out. I don't know that we've entirely ruined it for you, so go check it out and come back yeah. and tell us what you thought about the film. And do you think it's one of Powell's better films, or are you more of a Red Shoes, Black Narcissus kind of a person? We'll, yeah, we'll get into them. I think it's very possible that fans of our show could like all three films I do. separately. I, you did. Know? I did like the movie because I just, it's his signature staples. As you see that force framing that mm -hmm. he does, like the projector's going and you put your head through it. That, <laughs> yeah. that constantly, I'll force it to make it look right. That, yeah. that Paul does. Yeah. yeah, and then make sure, please like and subscribe to the channel. They don't yeah. cost you anything. And we do appreciate the support yeah. on the channel as well. Make as comments and like. That helps the show. It gets us out there, man. We yeah. appreciate it. Share, like, comment, subscribe. Thank you guys for joining us. Check out the Patreon link down below. And you can find all my film reviews over at GoatFilmReviews.com. We just finished 31 Days of Horror and we're moving on to some really cool stuff to end off the year with some Oscar coverage. Oh, of course you are. Yeah, to. Nice transition. Right? <laughs> right. And you can find my show, the St. Paul Filmcast, anywhere you find podcasts. And look for my interview with Josh Ungaretti, who mm -hmm. did the film Danny's Game that you can find on Amazon Prime. Oh, I'll give it a peep.